So this was going to be a PowerPoint, um, but um, it's not going to be a PowerPoint because it, 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 it doesn't work. Um, so uh, we're just going to wing it. Um, the title is, this is going to be a, a, a sort of a heavy talk. Um, I'm Dr. Doom, and Nancy is Dr. Hope and Change. And so uh, I'm going to get you really down on the floor, and Nancy's going to lift you up uh, into the land of, uh, of hope and, and whatever. So, so, so let's just get started. We live in this beautiful place, and, and, and it really is gorgeous. Try to imagine this. What would San Diego be like? What would the earth be like if all the garbage and the sewage and the toxic waste and the crap of the history of humanity had been dumped on the land instead of being flushed into the universal toilet called the ocean? I mean, because that is what we've been doing. I'm a New Yorker, go to New York, watch the garbage bags go out every day, dump the entire waste of New York City into the Atlantic Ocean every day. That's what we do. And we assume that the oceans will be wonderful and, and deal with it. And, you know, they're really big, and so for a long time they did. Um, let's just have four facts. The oceans cover more than 70% of the surface of the Earth. They have 97% of all the water on the planet. They mediate the biogeochemical cycles upon which all life depends. The oxygen in the air and everything about what we live and breathe and do is controlled by the dynamics of the oceans. And the, the oceans are an ecological disaster beyond description. We all hear about tropical rainforests. Tropical rainforests are, in most places, pristine by comparison to the condition of the ocean, including right out here where you all swim and you think it's wonderful, but um, it's not so great. Uh, and, and the real problem for those of us who worry about this sort of thing is that the oceans are virtually out of sight and out of mind and unfamiliar and very difficult and impossible to understand. So what I'm going to do really quickly without my pictures and all the rest is I'm going to talk about human impacts on the ocean and we're going to keep it really simple. So we'll talk about overfishing, pollution, and climate change. Then we'll talk about the rising storm, about what's happening right now that should scare the hell out of you. And then we're going to talk about how we avoid this. And how we avoid that is something um, that we're really not ready to deal with, although we are the worst in this country. I mean, most everywhere else people get it, but we are uh, antediluvian. So the environmental era began with Rachel Carson, uh, the publication of, of Silent Spring, and in the same year, uh, Dave Keeling's first publication, first measurements of the rise of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in Hawaii. And, and we call this the end of nature because at, from that point on, there was no place on the planet that was the way it was before people started to screw it up. And now, what Carson wrote about, of course, was DDT. Um, most of these people, people in this room should at least remember it came out when they were a kid. I, I remember it, not a kid. Um, um, and it was an amazing book, and it really changed American society. It created Earth Day. It did all this stuff. And it, the book was a very simple thing. People were terrified of DDT. And what Rachel Carson did, she wrote an entire book about saying, what's new, scary, and different because of DDT? What will happen if we keep on using it? Cancer, blah, 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 blah. And how could we do it differently? How could we fix it? The tragedy is that more than half a century later, those three questions are the same for virtually everything people do. And the answers to those questions are vastly more terrifying than they were when Carson wrote Silent Spring. So we're going to do the same thing, and we're going to do about the oceans, and then we're going to end up with people, and then you're going to try to enjoy your next course. Um, <laughs> we're going to ask, what are the things that people are doing in the ocean that are new, different, and scary? 
We're going to say, what are the oceans going to be like in 10 or 20 years? You know, not 100 years from now, but 10 or 20 years if we don't change it. And then how could we fix it? And, and um, you're not going to want to hear that. So we're going to talk about overfishing first. And I had this great map. Try to imagine the Atlantic Ocean uh, where everything is the color red near the coast because that's where all the fish are. And um, the only place that was sort of a pale blue is in the middle of the ocean. Well, today the entire Atlantic is pale blue. Um, there's about one thousandth to one ten thousandth the amount of fish in the Atlantic Ocean as there was 200 years ago or even 150 years ago. The fish stocks of the Atlantic are devastated. There is no sustainable fishery today in the Atlantic Ocean, and you continue to eat it and blah, 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 but that is the way it is, okay? And, and uh, when the cod collapsed in, in Newfoundland, and you know, three world wars, or two, depending on how you count, were fought over the cod of the Northwestern Atlantic, which fed all the slaves of the Caribbean, fed all the people of the Mediterranean, was the primary protein source for much of Europe for 200 years, and in 1982, the cod collapsed, 25,000 people lost their jobs. They have never come back. And today, they have a jellyfish fishery where the cod used to feed the world. Um, and, and the fact of the matter is that because we have all this great new technology, get on a tuna boat. You'd be terrified. You could declare war on the world on the technology that's in a tuna boat. And they are going to find the last tuna in the ocean because they can sell one in Tokyo for half a million dollars if it was never frozen a bluefin tuna, and if you eat bluefin tuna, you are sinning against the world. You should never do it. It is a crime, and you can do it in any restaurant in San Diego. Okay, and then um, beyond that sort of kind of fishing, you have to understand that most of the fish you eat is obtained by something called trawling. So imagine a gigantic ship. Imagine something the size of a locomotive. Imagine, to and it's got a big net on it. Imagine towing that locomotive-sized thing across the bottom of the seafloor and turning forests or buildings into parking lots. That's what trawling is. That's how you get your scallops. That's how you get your flatfish. That's how you get your pollock. That's what it all comes from. Fish McMuffins, all of it, it comes from trawling. The area of the ocean that has been converted into a parking lot level mud with rows in it that look like the rows in a cornfield after it's been harvested is greater than the area of all the forests that have ever been cut down on the earth by humanity in the entire history of humanity. So enjoy that fish. Okay, and so that's enough about fishing. Let's talk about pollution. And, and, and there, are, there are a lot of kinds of pollution, and you're probably really worried about oil spills. You know? I mean, oil spills are really bad. We watch Deepwater Horizon. We watch the nation lie to us. We watch the government lie to us. We watch BP lie to us and all the rest of it. But oil spills are nothing compared to the really serious kinds of pollution. They're just really ugly, and we don't like oil on our beaches. Um, albatrosses, these wonderful birds, you know, that. Uh, forage all over the world ocean and they come back with food are dying in their rookeries because their stomachs, this is a bird this big, a wingspan, you know, like this, and its stomach is full of 10 or 15 pounds of garbage, of tin cans, of plastic bags. They die. They stick that stuff into the mouths of their babies and they're gone. And, and there's, there's all kind of stuff. But um, what I want to talk to you about is the rise of slime. Um, I, I, I really thought it should have been the name of a rock group. It would have, Patty Smith, I mean, could have been the rise of slime. But so, so what the rise of slime is, all that cheap food you eat was made possible by turning natural gas into fertilizer. And as a consequence of that, there's an enormous quantity of nitrogen that gets flushed into the ocean toilet every day, all the time so you can have cheap food. And, and we could fix that, but we don't because lettuce would cost two cents a head more. So all this nitrogen goes down to the ocean. And just like you put fertilizer in your lawn to make it look green, 
guess what happens when it gets to the ocean? It fertilizes all of the plants that live in the ocean. And it fertilizes the, what we call the phytoplankton, the little algal cells in the ocean, um, so effectively that we have this glut of algae. And the poor little zooplankton that are supposed to eat them, they just can't keep up. So phytoplankton do something they never did in the history of life. They die of old age. And they sink to the bottom, and they rot. And when they rot, they use up oxygen, and the whole seafloor loses its oxygen, and anything that can't swim away dies. And that's called a dead zone. Well, the third biggest dead zone in the world is off the Mississippi River in the Gulf of Mexico. I like to say it's uh, bigger in the state of New Jersey, and being a New Yorker, it smells like New Jersey too. <laughs> but, but, but to have an idea of how big the dead zone is, start in Tijuana, go to Santa Barbara, that's not as big as the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And that's a place that used to have fish and oysters and make people a lot of money, and it's dead every summer. And so all that is gone, and all that's lost. And of course, you all knew about that because it's in the newspapers and publicized and all the rest. Okay, and when I started giving these depressing talks in, <laughs> in 2001, there were 150 dead zones. There are now 400 plus dead zones. Um, and I, I think of this verb I want to invent called the dead zonification of the global coastal ocean, which means the entire coast of all the developed continents will be dead zones. Uh, Europe's working on it really well, the entire Baltic down the German coast. They'll get to France. Lots of the Mediterranean off the coast of China is unbelievable. Um, it's, uh, you know, our way of life. Um, and, and along with dead zones, there's all this, I have these great, absolutely disgusting photographs of the northwest of Gulf of Mexico with a single toxic bloom, which stretches from the mouth of the Mississippi to Mexico, one toxic bloom. Uh, when that stuff comes ashore, it makes people sick, uh, fish kills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're all, in one way or another, related to the rise of slime, something we could stop. Um, something which is a consequence of the food we eat, uh, but we choose not to. And then, of course, there's climate change, and, and, um, which you all hear about. Let's just do a few little facts. The ice, I'm going to Antarctica with my wife. It's our big, big trip because, hey, go there now because it ain't going to be there. The way. So get your trip in there really early and maybe go to the Arctic first. Um, the Arctic will not have summer sea ice in 10 years or maybe 20. That means polar bears are toast. That means they'll be rummaging in garbage dumps. We'll put 16 in a zoo. We'll call them an endangered species. That's the end of that. We'll have explosions of seals, which will be like rats and cockroaches running around the Arctic Ocean because there's nothing to eat them. I mean, it just goes on and on. And, and in the Antarctic, it'll hold on longer. It's been ice for for something like 15 or 20 million years, but we're working on it and give it a, a few hundred years and most of that will be gone. Um, so say goodbye penguins, go see them while you can, put them in a zoo. Uh, coral reefs are dying because of uh, what's called coral bleaching and disease from being really warm. Um, and things that make their houses out of calcium carbonate are in real trouble because we're making the ocean into a kind of Coca-Cola ocean, which is really acidic. And it makes it really hard for the organisms to make their little oyster shells. So eat the oysters while you can, too. And then there's sea level rise. We're going to end up with the cheeriness of sea level rise. And, and Nancy and I both work on coral reefs. And you know we love coral reefs. I mean, I'm doing the stuff I'm doing now because the coral reef I loved and I worked on all my life you know, until into my 50s is now dead. A coral reef that had 60, 70 percent live coral cover is now covered by seaweed and has three or four percent live coral cover. And that's the Caribbean, more or less. And, and the Pacific is not far behind. Now, this is all happening because the, the corals are a symbiosis between the coral that um, provides the house for these little algae that live, and they photosynthesize, and they feed sugar to the coral. When it gets too hot, the algae can't make the food. The corals say you didn't pay the rent. They kick the algae out. 
then they starve to death unless they can get algae back, and et cetera. And, and the corals are weakened by all that, so they get sick and, and, and they have a lot of trouble. And so um, there are a few places in the Caribbean that still have beautiful reefs, but if you go to the whole north coast of Jamaica where I got started, uh, you can look at rotting seaweed on the surface of the reef because the corals are gone. Okay, um, so to summarize all this wonderful positive news I gave you, uh, what we're looking at is the ecological extinction of everything we value. The things we like to eat, the organisms that protect us from hurricanes, the mangroves, the marshes, and all this kind of stuff. So we're seeing this vast decline in what we want, and, and all that stuff we want is being replaced by the stuff we don't want. And just think, I, hey, I, I've lived in a walk up in New York where you know you have to kick the, the cockroaches with a baseball bat. Well, we're sort of creating a fauna and flora of the oceans, which are the rats and roaches of the oceans. And the thing that's really scary, and hey, we're, you know, people at Scripps are really smart, but the one thing we actually really, really don't know how to do is to put it all back together again. You know, remember when you were a kid, um, Humpty Dumpty sat in a wall and he had a great fall and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again. We don't know how to do it. Okay, so what'll be the consequences of business as usual? Um, I'm gonna read you a list. And I want you to know this has been vetted by people like Ralph uh, who, really know what they're talking about when it comes to climate and stuff like that. I'm a fake, but I, I, I just do it. Okay, so the sea surface is gonna be somewhere between two and four degrees centigrade warmer than it is today. Um, right out here off the Scripps Pier, there are organisms that used to have their northern limits in Ecuador, and they've moved up in 100 years. Everything's galloping towards the poles because of this increased warmth. Coral reefs are toast. I mean, they're gonna be around and they're not gonna completely disappear. But um, the Great Barrier Reef's already in very serious trouble. The Caribbean is a total mess. Um, we know ways to sort of stave that off. And Nancy's gonna be hope and change about how we can do it. But it's real grim. I mean, it's, it's just not good. Um, and then there are really scary oceanographic things. And I'm gonna take a minute and get real technical just for a second. So. It takes about a thousand years to turn the ocean over, to get the water that's at the top down to the bottom and the water that's at the bottom up to the top. And it takes a lot of energy to do that, which comes from the circulation of the earth, the rotation of the earth and all that kind of stuff. But the reason it takes a lot of energy is because the water at the surface is generally warmer and lighter and the water at the bottom is colder and heavier. And you know, it takes a lot of work to take something that's heavier and take it up and displace the stuff that's lighter. And so we call this vertical mixing is a fundamental process to the health of the ocean. Well, we're making the surface of the earth a whole lot warmer. The ocean is a lot warmer at the top. We're making it harder to mix. And we're already seeing that. People measure this. And so the consequence is that the oxygen that needs to get down to the bottom of the ocean is getting there a little less. The nutrients that are at the bottom of the ocean, which we need to fuel fisheries, are coming up a little slower. And so this is, a, this is actually a very scary thing. And if you think this is a fantasy, 250 million years ago, the vertical circulation of the ocean was turned off in what was called the Permian Crisis, and 92% of all the species on the planet went extinct. That's basic geology. Okay, acidification, the ocean is acidic, the dead zones are getting bigger, uh, the biogeochemical, I, I, this I usually don't say. I mean, you know, whether we have oxygen to breathe and all that kind of stuff is a function of, of biogeochemical cycles and then sea level rise. Now, the important thing to say is, you know, when we were running around saying, oh, climate change, it's a theory. Everything I've told you is not a model, it's data. It's really boring data. Ships go out all the time from Scripps and every other oceanographic institution in the world. They make measurements. The stuff I'm telling you is based on measurements. It's not based on models. It's not theory. It's real. 
It's factual. Get it. So there's only one question, and that's not whether all this stuff is happening. The only question is how fast will it happen, and how much time do we have to respond? And, 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 and we don't know, but it's fast. So now it's totally changed gears, and let's contemplate the fact that it's not just the things you probably don't care that much about that are suffering. It's not just the coral reefs. It's not just the fish or the little worms. It's us. Okay, you live in a desert, and you've been getting water that's not yours. And it's been coming from Colorado and the Colorado River. And they're getting pissed off because they don't have their water. And they're going to turn off the faucet. And then what you're going to do to sustain your entire beautiful society of San Diego is to make water out of the ocean. Now, you're blessed with sun, so you can do that with solar radiation. But, you know, you're going to pay for it. I mean, this is a desert. People don't live in deserts. The vegetation, the beauty of this place, everything about it is fake. It's, it's, the, it's, it's there at the generosity of stealing somebody else's water. We're going to need another round of drinks. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm getting there. Five minutes. Five minutes. Storms are getting stronger, et cetera, et cetera. So, 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 no, 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 no. So, the biggest question for the future, the biggest question for the future of the oceans is whether or not the oceans are going to get us first. And, and, and so let's just talk about sea level rise. I grew up in Florida. My house was at the highest point in Dade County, 21 feet above sea level. Most of Miami is three to five feet above sea level. Sea level will almost certainly rise about five to seven feet by 2100. That means entire South Florida is gonna be underwater, uninhabitable. And if you think I'm nuts, I get invited to the Naval War College by admirals, you know, brass buttons and all the rest of it to talk about this stuff because they know it's real and they're planning for it. They think about how, the Cold War now is how do you evacuate 10 million people from South Florida never to return. Okay. So there's that. Um, Florida keeps encouraging buildings uh, on, the, on the coast. I have this great picture of Florida where Miami becomes a little island. Miami Beach is completely underwater. But the picture that's really interesting is the one of New York. Because New York City is the safest major city on the East Coast. It has the best fortified coast. It's hard rock. Anybody hear about a little storm called Sandy? Have you seen the pictures of the subway at the World Trade Center with water fountaining up? Have you seen the pictures of the taxi parking lots with 1,000 taxis underwater? And my favorite picture is the Lincoln Tunnel with all the cars piled up like junk with the water spurting out. This is the safest major city in the eastern United States. Okay, so how do we stop this? First of all, we make fisheries sustainable. That means we have to enforce the law. That would be a big shock. Um, we, ha we have to get rid of, I, I mean, we do not enforce the law, you know, and we have to eliminate all the fisheries. We're paying people to fish to overfish. Your tax dollars are paying people to overfish. Um, we have to stop doing all the crap like trawling, which is destroying the ocean. We have to protect one third of it. But you shouldn't eat wild fish. There isn't enough wild fish in the world. Are we feeding ourselves? Are we going out and hunting bears and eating bear meat to survive? No, we have cows and sheep and goats. But when it comes to fish, we're doing the equivalent of going out and hunting our bear to eat the bear. We have eight billion people or seven or six. It's gonna keep getting bigger. There are not enough, we are not Jesus Christ. We cannot divide the fish and feed the world. So give up on wild fish. We have to make agriculture sustainable and that means solving this whole fertilizer problem. And we have to make energy sustainable. And you know, you could do it here. So why aren't people doing it here? Why aren't you all driving volts or, or, or leaves or something like that? All of you. 
why don't you all have solar panels on your roofs? You could have all the electricity in your house, but you don't do it. Okay, and, and, if we, and we had a great talk by an economist yesterday who said, you know, the only country in the world which isn't trying to do this is the United States. And he referred to us as a petro power, totally in the hands of the petro giants. Okay, this is it. All this horrible bad stuff is happening faster and faster. The problems aren't scientific. The problems aren't economic. We know how to make it different. The reason we're not making it different is because you don't want to. The reason we're not making it different is because we're not prepared to accept the social change and the political change that would be necessary to do it. I, I don't care. Um, the alternative, the alternative, you're safe here, you live here, it's beautiful. But there are going to be one to two billion climate refugees in the next 50 years. And they're going to be knocking on your door. Are you going to build a Berlin Wall? Are you going to keep Mexico out? They're going to be in real serious trouble. What are you going to do about that? We could confront it. We could solve it. We could actually make a world that really would be better. Or we can sit back and we can wait for the catastrophe to happen. And um, you can decide what we're going to do. But I know one thing. Susan will never invite me to give another talk. Thank you very much.